Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This being a show where I talk about shows of the supernatural, fantasy, and or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of The Vampire Diaries, as well as Grimm. Starting off with The Vampire Diaries, we have many things going on in this episode. Many relationships trying to be repaired. We have Damon working hard to try and repair his relationship with Bonnie. Bonnie's not having anything, any anything with it. She's just uh, super pissed at Damon. She doesn't even want him to even talk to her. She's like, if you want to talk from now on, you talk to Enzo. You don't talk directly to me. You tell him something and then he'll tell me. And it's like, wow. And um, I love the fact that she was pissed. She's like, he pops up after three years and he doesn't even bring my favorite flowers neither. It's like, damn Damon. It's like, you want someone to forgive you, at least bring her the things she likes. It makes you wonder would that really have made much of a difference? I think it probably would have. She's kind of just talking about the fact that she was almost over it and then the person, you know, he just comes up and pops back in her life. Because uh, she went through a lot in that time he was gone, you know, because, you know, it's, it, in this episode we see a flashback of what happened, you know, three years ago. The armory came after her and Enzo hit her for like those three years. And over that time he looked after her. Um... Obviously, like, it seems like she pretty got pretty accustomed to the situation pretty quickly. I mean, it didn't take too long because it kind of makes sense because Enzo was the only person that was really there for her. I mean, it's kind of the only person she could really drag into this situation or she'd, you know, if Damon was there, she'd ask him for help. But she, you know, was super reluctant to ask Caroline for help because, you know, her and Alaric, you know, got the kids, you know, uh, Tyler is off doing his thing. Same thing for Matt. And so, you know, Stefan's all with Val, so she couldn't go to him. The only person she could turn to is Damon, and he's not there anymore, so she had to rely on Enzo. And Enzo kind of talked to her, the fact that, talked to her through it, because she was like, don't let what Damon did kind of get to you. Let's not forget, me and him were buddies. We were prisoners in the same cell for, what was it, five years, and then just tee up and um, left me to die. So it's like, I can kind of understand what it's like being left by Damon, but he's selfish, and that's him. It's not anything you did wrong, that's 100% on Damon. And you see that relationship kind of develop a little bit more, like her, him teaching her how to play guitar and everything. Basically, you know, because he's still working, at the, working with the armory, because he's trying to figure out what they want with Bonnie. And you just see that, you know, I really thought that's kind of interesting, that little date situation he set up um, for New Year's Eve, like, a year and a half ago. Uh, I really like that. She got all dressed up, and they were dancing and just laughing and having fun. It's just like, it's weird. Like, as you be told, honestly, we've never seen Bonnie with anyone but Jeremy. Jeremy's is kind of, Jeremy's been her consistent boy. I mean, they've had her on and offs, but he's been the only, like, love interest we've ever seen her have in this Series has she had others? I don't remember. Jeremy's the only one that ever pops to head, pops in my mind when I hear that. But um, when I think of that, I mean, so it's like I don't know. So seeing her with someone else is kind of interesting. Seeing her in a relationship is kind of interesting. So especially with someone like Enzo, because Enzo's always been kind of a, a wishy-washy person. He's always kind of been like, oh. Do you trust Enzo? Do you not? It's like you, you never 100% know what side he was on. I mean, at least in the beginning, he was blunt about it. He's like, he's only looking out for himself and, you know, keeping Bonnie around is kind of self-interest because it's like if he prevents, you know, the armory from getting what they want, want because he wants to understand what they want her for because, you know. And even Bonnie brought it up. It's like, why is he so interested in learning about family? It's like, Bonnie, she knew her family, so it's it's easy to ask that question when you know your family, but it's like when you've kind of been all by yourself like he has it's like you you always wonder those questions like who was my family and why did they leave me behind it's just like to find that place you belong i guess you know it's like he's always kind of been on his own that's why he latched on to lily um stefan and damon's mom uh and the heretic so much because it was like a family the first family he's ever known he's always been by himself so that's why he latched on to them so hard so it's like I can understand why he'd want to get to know his family. Granted, it doesn't seem like his family is really worth knowing. Could we also find out the reason why Alex wants Bonnie? Because apparently a situation happened with one of Bonnie's cousins. Uh, what was her name? Lucy. And essentially, a um, situation happened. The vault was opened, but one of Alex, uh, Alex's other sister, not I think her name's Virginia. She's the one that's um, locked up in a mental... Uh, that uh, mental place in um, 
Asheville, North Carolina, and not her, but another sister is locked inside of the vault. She should be dead with all this time, like, oh, starved or whatever, but she's saying there's something keeping her alive, and she needs Bonnie to open the door because she's responsible. She says, I'm the reason why my sister's in that place in the first place, there in the first place, which is to say, which is me saying, thinking, like, why would you open that? Because whatever that thing is, it is not your sister anymore. Because, like, you know, Enzo brought it up, like I said, she would have starved out and died because then they said that was like four years ago that happened or something. It's like a normal human would have died by now. So it's like obviously whatever the hell is in there isn't your sister. Either it possessed her body or she got turned into something. And so like common sense would tell you not to open that door. But it's like she strongly believes in opening that door. You know, her sister is super reluctant, obviously, because you saw the way she went after Bonnie was willing to kill Bonnie to make sure that Bonnie doesn't open the vault. It's not like Bonnie wants to open the vault, but she is curious what's in there, what's so bad that the sister doesn't want Alex to get the vault open. And basically, Bonnie is running out of time. So basically, uh, Damon and Enzo made a deal with Raina. It essentially... in in exchange for them killing all the vampires that escaped from the um the jewel the uh, phoenix stone that's it all the um vamps that escaped from it they'll hunt them down and kill them but they want reina to give her last life the last the life she's living now give it to bonnie because they figured that will cure her and it, it brought up some very interesting things well for one um how reina acted because she was like the entire time I've been hunting vampires, I've never had a break. I've never had, you know, it's kind of like been a 24-7 job hunting vampires. You know, I've never had an opportunity to do anything else to live life. She's like, I just want one day where I get to just eat some cheeseburgers, just just relax, stare at the sun, bask in the warmth of it. Just relax. You actually see her come into te like tears in her eyes. And it's very interesting because we've never seen that human side to Raina. Because the, the only side of Raina we've ever seen is the vampire hunting side of her you know because even in the beginning when we saw her like you know being trained by her master the one who passed on the hunter uh, passed on you know being a hunter to her even then we never saw her in just a regular scenario we saw her in a vampire hunting scenario so we she's never had a chance just to be a regular girl so but damon kind of blows her off it's like yeah blah 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 whatever and they end up hunting down the vampires. One of the vampires they ended up coming across turns out to be Bo. Uh, he was in a new body. Uh, Enzo and Bonnie were hesitant to kill him, but Damon did it anyway. Because Damon's like, I'm going to do whatever it takes if, if it means, you know, saving her. Bonnie didn't appreciate it or whatever. Because she's just still pissed at like, oh, now you want to try and do what's best for me. He even gets up in Enzo's face because he's like, this is your fault because you gave her these pills. But Enzo's like, I was there for her when you didn't. You ran away. And then Damon's like, yeah, I did. But if anything happens to Bonnie, I will hunt you down and I will kill you. And I just kind of got chills. It's like, oh, man, look at you being the protective best friend. But even Bonnie was like, you know what? Enzo was there for me. I trust him a lot more than I trust you. Because this entire time, Bonnie has been, like, holding on to his letter, which is very interesting. I would have expected, like, at the beginning when you see her take it with her three years ago, I was like, oh, she's, when she picked it up, I was like, oh, she's about to rip it up or throw it away. It's like, no, she took it with her. She's had it this entire time. Because no matter what she says, it, you know, it's a reminder of how much of a jerk Damon is that, you know, moving on past him. There is a piece of her that was always hoping she'd get to see him again. She won't admit it because she's super pissed at what he did. But she did miss him, and, you know, it's going to take a while for her before she actually admits. You can kind of tell just the way she's acting. Like, the fact is that she held on to it that long. It's not just a reminder of, like, moving past him. It's a reminder of him because she missed him. Because, you know, everyone else has kind of moved on with their lives. Like, Caroline's got the kids in a lark, like I said, and Elena's still in the coffin in her situation so she won't ever be able to hang out with you know her best that one best friend ever again and caroline her time with caroline is going to be very you know scarce because of the kids so it's like she's kind of the only one of the group who kind of doesn't at that point in time they really have a life going on per se you know and you know her and damon probably could have you know spent that time together because like neither one of them really had anything you know, because Damon had to wait for Elena to wake up, so, and that wouldn't happen for another 60 or 70 years, so. 
I thought that was kind of interesting. But sadly, we do have Bonnie running down to about a week. And they did hunt down a whole bunch of other vampires. I did like the first vampire they uh, fought, went up against how Damon... It, I forgot what the, you know those warning signs like kind of like oh uh, be careful um, be careful floor is wet or whatever those type of signs Damon literally cut a vampire's head off of that I was like that always astounds me how they you can do something like that I guess you do something fast enough and with enough force you can slice anything off just like you know Klaus did it one time well, I'm sure he's done it more than once but he did it fairly recently where he just sliced someone's head off of his bare hand so it's like like I said, fast and strong enough, it's possible. But I, I brought it up earlier, and I kind of want to go back to it. The fact is that this episode also dealt with Stefan and Caroline, specifically the relationship. More specifically, it dealt with the tr love triangle between him, Alaric, and Caroline. Because he went to visit Alaric, kind of bringing up all these questions. It's like, it's very interesting that... It took his brother coming back into his life for uh, Stefan to kind of really try to, because he wants to kind of explain everything to Caroline. But Laura is kind of like, no, it's too late. You had your chance back then, but now, you know, now that me and her are in a good place from getting married and we have kids, you want to kind of ruin all that now. You had your chance back then to explain things to Caroline, but the entire time you were away, you didn't write her a letter. Even though we saw that he did try to write her a letter, he just wasn't able to. He just couldn't find the word to explain. And it's kind of sad that it took his brother coming back in this whole situation for him to be able to be like, yeah, yeah, I need to make this up to Caroline. Because there's, you know, he still cares about her, especially now that he's kind of realized even more because Valerie left him. Because, you know, she realized this shit. Like, yeah, you're it's still in love with Caroline and it's not me you're in love with. You're not in love with me as much as I'm in love with you. That Troopy Toad is sadly... Stefan was just with her out of obligation because he did care for her, but not nearly as much as she cared for him. And it's like, if the whole Raina situation hadn't happened, he'd be with Caroline. I always wondered how that situation ended up the way it did. Like, Alaric and Caroline and Stefan and Valerie, and that's why. Just because he ran away, because he... I mean, like, all he had to do was even explain it to Lark, the reason why he left. The reason why he left was because he saw how happy Caroline was with him and the kids, and it broke his heart. Because he felt like he didn't have a place in their world anymore. But he never explained that to Lark. He just kind of pushed it at Lark, because he was just like, yeah, I noticed the fact is that you, you, um, there's another bedroom in your house. You've been sleeping there, haven't you? Like, you and Caroline aren't in love. She doesn't love you. He's like, yeah, so what if we're not in love? I'm... I'm trying to be worthy of her love. I'm No, I am worthy of it. Can you say the same thing about yourself? And it's just like... I, I don't know in that type of situation like who I would really side with. Because Alaric has been there for Caroline just like Enzo has been there for Bonnie. You know, Stefan can say what he want about Damon running away. But the fact of the matter is, sadly, he did the exact same thing. And he kind of was in his head... Kind of the same way Damon was that, you know, when all things were said and done, he thought he could pick his life back up right where he left it off. Like I said, he didn't have the foresight to think. I mean, because obviously the next time he woke up, you know, Bonnie would be dead. He'd have Elena again, but Bonnie would be, you know, dead because that's the only way Elena was going to come back because of the uh, curse. You know, once Bonnie dies, Elena would be back, but he would never be able to meet Bonnie again, so that's, I guess, that, I mean, that's the major reason why she was super pissed about him. Yeah, he's been going for three years, but he wasn't planning on coming back after three years. He wasn't planning to come back until she died, so he, they'd never see each other again, and he had the audacity to leave a note to her, you know, rather than saying it to her face to face, and it's like, what would he have, you know, what does that letter say? I think he read it, like, in a mono, like, in a, you know, voiceover, it was kind of read, I think. No, I think we... It was the one he sent to Alaric, and granted, you know, I doubt he wrote the same exact thing. So it's like, what did he write to Bonnie? And we also had, you know, Stefan actually coming across Caroline when him and Alaric went back to their to Alaric's house, and they and he's like, Alaric's kind of like, oh, I can go, you know, put the kids to bed, but then uh, Karen was like, no, I can't. She just kind of said hi to Stefan and just walked away. And Alaric closed the door, and it's just like, like I said, it's kind of sad because Stefan thought, you know, once Raina's curse was done, on some level, whether he'll admit it or not, he was thinking he'd be able to go back home, be with Caroline, and it'd be everything would be okay. But sadly, he kind of made the same mistake that Damon did. 
that he just assumed everything would kind of work its way out, that he'd be able to pick up right where he left off. But sadly, both for both of them, everyone else has moved on without them. But at least Damon has the knowledge of admitting like what he did was a mistake. But it's the sad thing is he can't take back that mistake. He can't take back those three years he was gone. All he can do is try and repair the relationships, but that's not going to be easy. And I doubt it's possible for, for him to kind of start fresh with them. I don't I don't know. Like it's like I honestly have no idea what Damon's gonna do. But all he can do right now is do his best to try and save, you know, Bonnie. And do what he's gonna do so by, you know, hunting down all the other vampires that are in, you know, that um Raina had sealed away in a Phoenix stone. And there are a lot of them. I did like seeing that final shot. It's just like the room is covered with all the like papers, you know, all the markings she made on them, which are, I can only assume each one is connected to one specific vampire. So it's like, that is a lot of vampires that were sealed in there. I will admit, I kind of brought it up earlier and kind of shied away from it, that whole Bo situation. I thought that was going to turn into something else. I thought it was like, oh yeah, Bo. Um, he'll help them out, but it's like he's not a heretic anymore, so he's not necessarily useful to them. But it's like he probably does have some knowledge. It does make you wonder, like, when the vampires do die in their new bodies, do they just die? Or are their spirits released? I guess they just simply die because originally vampires, when they died, they go to the other side. Now moving on to this week's episode of Grimm, which we had this week's... Vessin, this week's case was a Vessin who essentially... Essentially, he, he went after people who were near death. This is kind of what his species does. They go after people who are near death, and they suck their bones out. Typically, they'll throw people off cliffs, you know, because it, it's easier to digest digest the bones like that. But they throw people off cliffs and then do it. But his method was essentially running them over twice. That's how, I guess, that's his way of breaking the bones apart and making them easier to digest, which is kind of like breaks them down into like a, a liquidy powder and then I said liquidy powder just liquid and then drunk some like sucks them up like that it's just to me it made me cringe every time he'd run over someone and do it twice it's just like mm. um but the sad thing is he was doing it for his parents because his parents were old and they weren't able to feed like they used to like so he had to bring them food he didn't enjoy doing what he was doing but he didn't really have much of a choice he, i guess he felt like as their son he was obligated to help them out and killing people was just his way of you know doing that like he's because every person he did it to he was apologizing like sorry i don't want to do this i just have to he even like said it nearing the end of the episode that he was going to like it'd probably be better off just killing his parents because he's tired of doing this for them. I did like the fact is that they were going to use Monroe for bait. Poor Monroe. And that thing, um Rosalie had made for him. It was that uh, liquid that basically it represented, it was to make him smell like he was dead. Because they, they could smell people near death, and so the point was to spray it on his clothes. I loved everyone's reaction when they smelled it. They were just like, they were dry heaving and just pinching their nose. And like afterwards they were talking like this, because you could tell they weren't breathing through their nose anymore. And I love what Rosalie said. She's like, and when you come home after all this is done, leave your clothes outside and make sure you take a shower. And it should be possibly okay. And he's just like, I understand, sweetie. And the kiss, I was just like... Poor, poor Monroe. Even while he was laying down on the ground, he had to make sure he plugged his nose so that he could lie still and not attract anyone's attention. But the whole plan kind of fell apart when who kind of like vogued. I don't even like I said. Like, is he actually a vessin? Because I was because at the beginning you saw him kind of in the police station, kind of like. Well, I mean, first at the beginning he pulled that what looked like fur out of his mouth so it looked like something from some animal and then his hand was kind of morphing voguing and he kind of completely voguing at the end of the episode and he was track he was chasing after that dog and got himself knocked out so it's like what is he turning is he legitimately turning into a vessin or something vessin like maybe it's like he the scratch is kind of the lichen throat scratch is kind of morphing him between half human half vessin it's just like i don't i don't know what that's about because he didn't tell anyone about it it's like he's been noticing these strange things but he hasn't told anyone it's like why not 
you literally know tons of people you can go to about this. Uh, Nick, Hank, Rosalie, Rosalie, and Monroe. It's like there's tons of people you can talk to about this, but he's kind of keeping it hush hush, which is like I don't understand why you're doing that. But I mean, I guess he he kind of thinks he's going a little crazy that everything's kind of in his head. He's just imagining things. But it's like even then, I I don't know. Uh, but sadly, it ended it ended up with the uh, Vesson dying. I think his name was Charlie. And the twisted ending part was the fact is that his mom and dad basically feed it, fed on his body. And it's just like, oh, because a little Hank and Nick are outside the um, Morgan and just like, is that are they? He's like, yeah, should we stop them? And it's just like, no, it's just that's so twisted. They're like, oh, we can't let him go to waste. It's like, OK, now that you ate your son, what are you going to do now? You're going to die anyway, because like there's no one else to help you feed. This is your last, quote unquote, easy meal. And which is like it's so disgusting what it looks like when um all the bones have been removed, their bodies all rubbery and stretchy and disgusting like this. Just like oh my god. Um other things that went down in this episode was the fact is that Eve visited Rosalie because she sensed Rosalie and Monroe, you know, um last episode, you know, when she was having her talk with Adeline. But um but obviously Adam's a little rusty. Adeline's a little rusty, so she didn't really sense them, and just like, and essentially, Eve was warning them, being war, warning um, her, saying like, "Yeah, she won't be rusty, you know, given enough time." So it's like you should be careful because something like that will happen. If something like that happen again, Adeline will notice you, and basically bringing up the fact is about do do they know about her powers and you know Adeline admit I mean Rosalie admits that she knows and Nick knows but Nick hasn't said anything to Adeline about him knowing and she's like hmm it's kind of interesting and then she kind of brings up like you said that you would kill Adeline if she did something to Nick and then she's like do you have a she's like do you have a problem with it she's like no it's something I would say and then when she left and Juliet so it's like Rosalie thinking like I'm thinking it's like no matter what she says she might be Eve, but there's still some part, at least that's what she's thinking, and that's what I'm thinking. There's a little bit of Juliet left inside of her, so. I don't know. Like I said, it could be completely tied to the mission, the reason why she said that, but I'm thinking it's like more than that. It's like, no, there's still a little bit of Juliet in there that cares about Nick, which would be awesome, though, because it'd complicate things even more. Because things are already complicated enough, because, you know, you have him, his relationship with Adeline getting to where it was, and now things are even more complicated because, you know, he knows she's a hex and beast. She knows she's a hex and beast, but uh, she doesn't know that he knows. About her being a hex and beast again. So, uh, we also have um, a very sweet moment in the episode where um, Adeline, near the end, I think it was exactly at the end where she was reunited with um, her daughter Diana. Essentially, you know, Sean had set up a meeting, and you know, Eve looking into things found out about this meeting. I don't, because I think she was hacking into Adeline's phone. I don't know if she was actually able to or not. I think so, I could be wrong, but essentially she had, he had drugged her, kind of knocked her out, and then when she woke up, there was Diana waiting for her, and she was hugging Diana, but she was looking at Sean with kind of discontent, because she had told Nick about, because she kind of confessed to Nick, she's like, I have something to tell you, uh, that, you know, basically about Sean, and then Nick told her about, you know, Sean's connection to Black Claw, and it's just like, but I thought the resistance had Diana, but he's talking about, he's, you know, the people he's working with, or like, you know, that he has Diana, it's just like, for one, that's interesting, because it's like, it, I love because, you know, because Nick, because Nick is just waiting for her to tell him the truth, and it's just like, that wasn't the truth he was, you know, that wasn't the secret he was expecting. Because, you know, they talked about, you know, being a little bit more honest with each other because their relationship is weird, you know. They were sworn enemies and now they're kind of lovers. So they kind of want to build, like, work on that relationship. You see Nick's a little hesitant towards her. Um, but he is, like, giving her the benefit of the doubt because truth be told, as you see, he's leaving Kelly with her because if he didn't 100% trust her, he I doubt he would do that. But Because he sees the person who Adeline is, even though she is back to being a hex and beast. I mean, granted, she doesn't know he know, knows, but she still hasn't changed from the person she she's become. Like, 
But maybe that's a slow process. Maybe eventually she'll completely turn back into who she was, which is kind of sad because I like the person Adeline's become. She's not kind of crazy and manipulative. Kind of the bad person she was before. But granted, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happened to her, was, you know, especially with um, Diana. That's kind of why she switched back over to kind of doing what she did to Nick, you know, stealing his grim powers and um, doing what she did. But it does bring up the question, like, who does die? Who, like, because the last time we saw the resistance, specifically Miser, Meisner was with Diana, like, when, you know, the king died. So it's like, she was with the resistance, but now Black Claw has her, which made me think, okay, either she's a fake, which is kind of like a being, looks like it's not the case, or some of the people within the resistance are Black Claw members, or there's some people within Black Claw or resistance member. I, I don't know how to interpret that because last time we saw she was with the resistance because Meisner hasn't said anything about that. He's had contact with Sean, but he hasn't really said anything to him about it. We actually haven't seen him or trouble for a couple episodes now, but it's like that situation. And like, I'm kind of thinking maybe it is the fact is that there are some black call members who are resistance members. So they had access to her, but it's like, why would they hide her away so long? Why would they keep her away from her parents then? I don't know, this whole thing's a little shady. I feel like Meisner's organization isn't as, I don't know, it's starting to look a little suspicious, just in my opinion, though. And another thing came up in this episode that I thought was interesting, there was the lady, I can't remember her name, but she was uh, the one, she was uh, Hank's physical therapist. Uh, when he uh, messed up his leg. When was that? Season 2 or 3, right? I don't remember when it happened. But, um... Because I'd completely forgot about it until she mentioned it. Like, I was like, well, I, you've been up here before, haven't you? And I was, and she's, like, helping out my little brother. And I was like, yeah. I was like, I don't remember the details, but, like, you're actually a Vesson, right? And it was like, yeah, it's the same girl. I just don't remember the story or her. But it was kind of, I love that they had dinner. It was kind of interesting how she was a little forceful with it. She's like, no, I'm not going to leave her until I make sure uh, we're able to get in contact or whatever. And she's like, oh, let's have dinner tomorrow night. And you can tell Hank was a little nervous because she's asking all these questions. Like, so you still working with the groom? He's like, yeah. How long have y'all been partners? It's like, uh, about going on six years. And even he's kind of acting a little nervous around her because it's like, yeah, because he's like, I don't know, like dating a vest. And I mean, it's not something that comes up that often. I mean, every, you know, he hasn't had the best track record with dating vest. And I mean, because remember he was dating Adeline at one point. Granted, she had poison the cookies so he couldn't help but fall in love with her and at the time he didn't know about Vesson so he just you know thought he was just in love so that's kind of one example but this is kind of I think this has that it's come up a little bit but it's never been you know come up that often just uh humans and Vesson regular folk and Vex, Vesson being in a relationship, so it's kind of a weird thing for him, because even Nick is like, have y'all slept together? He's like, no, 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 we're just taking things slow. It's kind of interesting, because him and, I guess you can honestly say Nick and Adeline have the most extreme version of that relationship, because it's like, she's a hexen beast, and he's a Grimm, so it's kind of like, that makes it even more extreme, because it's like, Vesson and Grimm's are the polar, op polar opposites, they're mortal enemies, but here these two are dating, so... Just an interesting comparison. But that's really all I want to talk about in this episode. To the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.